Gary, where'd you learn to play like that? Uh, I guess all I can say is practicing, you know, like in the basement. I'm, I'm one of those guys that spent numerous hours slogging away, practicing, you know, just yeah. back from the uh, late 60s and early 70s, it was serious sort of free love, drugs and all that. And I remember playing for three days oh, oh, non-stop no. without sleeping because, I mean, in those days you didn't have YouTube. Yeah. So you had to learn everything yourself. Yeah. I, I used to get Sly and the Family Stone, Temptations, and just play it hours, James Brown, just spend days on it. And I think the fact that I did that sort of moved me ahead because the reason I got the gigs is that I, I was sort of well-oiled really playing a lot. And in those days, there weren't that many bass players. Everyone wanted to be a guitar player. Mm -hmm. Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck, so... Bass players were hard to find who could play, yeah. and I, not that I was that great, but I still had the enthusiasm and the energy. What attracted you to music and the bass in the first place? Um, I guess the original inspiration was Hank Marvin, Shadows, and then I um, basically I had a, a newspaper stand on Newtown Station in 1964, so I earned enough money out of that to go and see the Beatles live. Wow. And so seeing the Beatles live, that was it. I mean, from then on, I um, basically followed Hero Worship, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs, really? Ray Brown the Whispers, and Ray Brown the Whispers, basically my band, they took us under their wings and, and they uh, let us get up on their gig at the Beach House every Sunday in their break and we'd get up, this young 16 year olds, get up on all this great Fender gear, all their John Manners yeah. and all, all the great guys and uh, Laurie Barclay and Ray Brown, really nice guys. They would just let us play their instruments and play Stand By Me. Within uh, six months of that, we got a contract with Festival Records, number one company in, in Australia, put out a record. So it was from then on, it was go. Yeah, now that was because of Stand By Me. Yeah, one song we played and they said, you guys are great, you're signed. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of the band? The Amazons. Is there YouTube footage? Yes, um, not footage, but the, the track that was on that is, is on YouTube, yeah. What song was it? It was called Ain't That Loving Your Baby. Okay. And nope. the B-side is a song written by Tony Barber, who was one of the original Elastics. Right. And I did Long Way to the Top about 12, 14 years ago. Yes. And Tony Barber was with the original Aztecs, and I couldn't wait to see, see him again because he produced and wrote the B-side. So I went up to him, and he had no recollection whatsoever of the song or doing it. Right. And he never took drugs in his life. Oh. <laughs> so I couldn't believe he wrote, wrote the B-side and produced it. See, the, the uh, A-side, Ain't That Loving Your Baby, was produced by Bill Shepard, who produced all the Bee Gees hits. Right. And, and we uh, came in to do the B-side... On the Monday, and they said, "Oh, sorry, Bill's flown to England." So he flew to England on the Monday to do all the BGs. So we, we had to another producer came and did the B side, which is Tony Barber. Right. Okay. And you've had an incredible, like your resume just reads unbelievably. I'd like to go through it. Yeah. So your first band was the Amazons. Yes. Yeah. What What did you achieve with that band? Um, I guess, in those days, the musical side of it hadn't hit me. It was all fun, girls and, and, and just, just the excitement of it all. I guess it really didn't hit me until I joined the Dave Miller set um, and I found a young guitar player, a crew cut fella called John Robertson who I recruited into the band yeah. and within six months he got me ousted you know, okay. and put his, put his friend in basically because it was all about fun for me and you know I wasn't up to up to it compared to the guy he knew he'd been working with who who was Bob, I think Bob Thompson he was a great bass player so I, I hadn't got to that level of of getting serious about the bass and it was probably the best thing he ever did because that happening to me is when the crossover happened I went oh I don't want that to happen again yes from then on it was go so John Robinson did me an amazing favour by sacking me from that band and giving me the, the heads up on well you've got to get good at this you know, so from then on it was all work yeah yeah how many hours practice did you do today I'm telling you I, I, I still up to 
even now, years ago, I used to do six, eight, ten hours a day, just trying to get better. And like I said, you didn't have anything to learn from, so it was all about teaching yourself and you getting know, records. Yeah, and basically, I never uh, learned to read music, and I failed music at school. <laughs> that surprises me. I, I was I always thought of you as a as a reader. No. Okay. No, well, you know, the incredible thing is uh, one of the great gigs in 1968, I um, was in Hair, the original Hair. So, I did know that. So there again, that's why I thought you were probably yeah. a reader. Yeah, no, well, I'll tell you how, how it happened. The, the original bass player in Hair had dropped an acid trip and walked off the scaffolding and broke his arm. Right. And they rang me the next day and said, listen, we'd like you to come in and check out this show and see if you want to play it. And I walked in with my bass, and they said, well, I'm really sorry to have to do this to you, but you will have to play the show tonight. The whole <laughs> show, with all the incidental music, and so I'm there with masses of sheet, all the sheet music. Luckily, it was chords, so it was not notes. So I, I from then on, I joined here, and I joined a band called uh, Tony Gaha and the Inn People, who were really the hottest blood, sweat and tears, Chicago type with four horns and all the greatest players in town. And I was the ring-in in the sense, the only one that couldn't read music. And basically they used to, the keyboard player had wanted to get one of his friends in who was a great reader. And uh, he said, listen, we've got to get rid of this guy because he can't read, you know, we need to get up with it. And uh, the drummer had recorded our gig on a little cassette player and he said to the leader of the band, no, he's not going, he's got a great feel. And so what they used to do, they actually hired uh, one of the top notation writers to come and teach me the score line, note by note. Right. And the rest of the band were reading and he'd t tell me, he'd be put paid. Your finger here, put your finger he was paid. Yeah, put your finger here, put your yeah, finger Yeah, he was paid to teach me what notes they were on the notation, right. which is, shows you... Right. In those days, the readers couldn't feel, right, and the field players couldn't read. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, wow, yeah. Bobby, the keyboard player in um, in here, he was a great jazz piano player. Bobby Gibbett. Bobby Gibbett. Oh, one of my main, uh, Gibbett, basically, uh, how we say heroes. Yes. Because I mean, playing with Bobby, uh, I was like a kindergarten compared to playing with Bobby. Yeah. Herbie Hancock. Did, he because was, he's a very generous person. I had a couple of lessons with him, just jazz theory, you know, at one stage years ago, and, uh, you know, I just found him an incredibly generous person. Would, would he sit down and tell you things? And No, no, no. He, he, he was, didn't have much time. For, it's basically with Bobby, you just observed and took it on board. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I mean, I, I can't believe that I actually had a gig, and we used to play the Talent Quest at Gladesville Bowling Club with Bobby Gibbett, <laughs> with all these... Can you imagine a talent quest in those days? It was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I mean, he, you know, he would couldn't wait to get out of there. You know, the top mm. guy, jazz guy. The reason Bobby was so amazing is that even by overseas musicians, he was recognised as one of the the world's greats because he was like Herbie Hancock, which he hammered everything like not just played it, he hammered it. Yeah. No, I remember when I'd go to his place and, like, I play guitar. It wasn't piano, but we talked theory, you know, wanted to learn about improvisation. And there, was, there were pictures of him with Oscar Peterson and, and you know, I, I knew this this fellow was really something. Yeah, you know? well, you know, Kenny Kirkland, who was Sting's keyboard player, one of the world's greatest keyboard players, I was, I was in New York and I went to the bar and I mentioned that I was a friend of Bobby's. Man, drinks all night, you know, yeah, a friend of Bobby's, you <laughs> know, so... Yeah. It was a, a good name to mention in New York. Yeah, yeah. So after the Dave Miller set, after, where did you go from there? I formed a band called Birth, which was... That uh, way they can't push you out. No, that's right. <laughs> I formed it. It was Alan Marshall from the Plastic Tears, who was a fantastic singer. And uh, let me think. Oh, some amazing users. Tony Hicks from a band called Backdoor in England. A real great jazz rock band, which was a new thing for me, but we, we were doing some seriously out, out there stuff and and, and uh, trying to break some new boundaries. That lasted for a while. Then Hair came along, and from Hair, I uh, got the job with Jess and John the Copper Wine, which is uh, and Wendy Saddington, and we did 
Well, Asia Festival with Wendy, and we had our hit Teach Me How to Fly. Basically, I had a bit of a falling out with the drummer, Peter Figures, and it came to a head in uh, Adelaide at a university gig, and I said, that's it, I'm out of here, see you later. And I f flew out of uh, Adelaide, and 12 hours later, the whole band was in a head-on smash. Injuries, everything was written off, so my timing there was immaculate. Unbelievable, yeah. You may have uh, extra sensory perception, uh, Harry. Well, you know, and then basically we, uh, I, I joined a band called Mighty Kong with Ross Wilson. Okay, yes. And I didn't actually get to play live because basically in those days we used to smoke a little bit of pot and we would basically ended up in the slammer for one day. We got bailed out and I said, oh, Melbourne, no, forget this, I don't want to know about Melbourne. So I came back to Sydney and joined Renee Gay and Mother Earth, which was basically... Uh, Oh, just before that, there was a great band I was with, which is Red McKelvey and the Third Union Band, which is seriously, after Flying Circus, the second great country rock band, because mm. Red McKelvey was the gun on the country guitar. He was amazing, like James Burton. I'm still a big fan, so uh, Red, Red basically taught me how to play a 2-4, which people think 2-4 country music is easy, but it's one of the hardest things there is because of the balance way of playing it you have to really be on the money to make it work right. so I, I sort of learned that from Red moved on to Rene Geyer and that lasted for a while and then started my whole thing with Kevin Boric my uh, from 74 onwards right up to a couple of years ago Kevin Boric was my one of my main thing apart from Rene Kevin yes. was my next main thing you know and I used to work with him non-stop which included 24-hour drives. He, he would drive from Cairns to Sydney non-stop, you know. Yeah, now those two acts, Renee and, and Kevin, I want to spend a lot of time on talking to you about, but before we do, let's go back and I'd like to talk about uh, Jeff St. John and Wendy Saddington, your time with them. What, what, what were your experiences? Nothing but great. Jeff mm. was just, it was amazing to be on board a band with a singer that good. Mm. His just, voice was just incredible, like soulful, just it was like being with one of the great black soul singers and mm. Jeff Jeff we we were all in awe of Jeff because mm -hmm. I mean to, to sing like that and to have that stage personality that he had he did I never saw that, that oh, was before he was doing time. wheelies and you know, on his on his <laughs> wheelchair wheelchair and, and wow. seriously he, he was an amazing act to catch because yes. apart from singing great he was you couldn't take your eyes off him yeah, yeah, yeah. and and it was a really mighty band Yes. I, I remember seeing him on TV when I was young, you know, they'd, they'd be on like, oh, I don't know, happening, 60s, happening, 70s, those, so were you on those? Uh, yeah, we did bandstand, uh, all, all those things, and we had, we, we had the, f the fortunate thing that we had the best, seriously, the greatest guitar player in the country at the time, Ross East, who became my best friend throughout my whole career. We still, up to his death a year ago, talked every week for an hour at a time, because we were we we were so locked in from those early days and he was an amazing guitar player which you can have a listen to the solo and teach me how to fly which most people still think is the greatest solo in australian pop history <laughs> that every solo he put down on that track was completely different. That was just one that he ripped off on that one. So it was nothing. He was, in a way, like me. He, he, you know, with Renee 
and most all the other bands I play with, I don't actually play the same lines night after night. Not one night do I keep one line. It's always trying to improve, try this, try that. And I guess in a way that's why I got the gigs because it was never about sort of reproducing. It was more about trying to discover what can we do to make this fresh for the audience mm -hmm. on that night rather than just playing stock standard what's on the record. Yeah. What was Ray Ross's pedigree? He was an orphan basically that was born in Brisbane Hospital and he found out later that he was uh, a society lady who had got pregnant to a musician in Sydney, a famous musician. Right. So no one knows who that famous music could be. Could be anybody, you know. But he he basically grew up in uh, Bundaberg, and the guy called Freddie Hampton took him from Bundaberg, found him up there, this amazing tarp land, brought him to Sydney, and he joined a band called Jess and John and the Yama, which was the precursor to Jess and John the Copperwine. And we used to have a lot of fun. Ross was a crazy sense of humour, and it was all about let's let's have a great time. So we we, we clicked from the beginning. We we were together, great friends, right up to the end, you know. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, and Wendy Saddington, seriously, in those days, was just, you know, think of you think of America and Janis Joplin, well, you, you repeat that in Australia with Wendy Saddington, because yeah. her emotion and her power on a gig, you, you just, in a way, that's why Renee was always a massive Wendy Saddington fan. <laughs> She was, she she didn't take anything very seriously, and in a way, that's why she didn't become a world star because she did the copper wine a couple more years. We had a band called Teardrop with Peter Figures and Ross East, which was just Wendy Sandington and this core bunch from the copper wine. We did that for a year or so, and from then on, she dropped out and joined the Hari Krishnas, and she's with the oh, Hari Krishnas yeah. her whole life. Is she still alive? I'm not, no, she no, died she a died few died. years ago, but she was Hare Krishna her whole life, right. which meant that the ego was gone. So she didn't have that thing that made you a star anymore, so the opportunity was lost because when people saw her in a heyday, they thought, well, this, this woman's going to be taking over from Janis Joplin because she was just like that power and the singing was just incredible. So uh, I think my most fortunate thing in my musical career is hooking up with the greatest singers, playing with Doug Parkinson. I remember backing Doug Parkinson back in 1972 in gigs, you know, and like, so I, met, I, I actually became known for backing the singers, which was a pretty good thing to, to be involved yeah. with, you know. Mm -hmm. who, were on the, who was on guitar then? Well, all different. Tim Piper, there was Kevin Burrett sometimes, also Johnny Dick on drums. Greg McKelvey on one of the runs. So it was, you know, I mean, personally, Doug Parkinson has always been Australia's soul king. He's the number one. Renee's the number one female. Doug is the yeah, number one male. Yeah, and it's yeah. always been the same. And the strange thing, after all these years, it hasn't changed because the new ones haven't upset those two. So they still rule. Yeah, that was in focus, huh? No, in focus was Doug's band, but once that broke up, he started going out as Doug Parkinson and would pick up Musos as he went. 
Right. So yeah. it's always, always the best around he could get. Yeah, yeah. Now, Rene Gay, you've had a long association, and and really, it's been one of one of the most important institutions in Australian music, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, I think obviously it's by far the the uh, career with Rene is what I'm most proud of because when I look at all the music that we made on look at it on YouTube, it was seriously, uh, it really lifted my game with soul music. My style is basically I'm a soul bass player. I, I remember when fusion music came in around the late 70s, I actually thought, well, that's it for me. <laughs> I'm gone because these guys just play so amazing. How am I going to do this? But the great thing is that fusion bit the dust within a few years. So, I mean, and soul was always at the forefront. So I was very lucky that I picked the genre naturally that I, you know, because I'm a Motown fanatic. That's my thing. I, I think of all the things I practiced 10, 12 hours a day, it was all Motown playing. I, I, every day I would pull out the whole Motown hit catalogue and play them from go to well. And can you imagine the amount of stuff you learn from playing so many changes and accents? And So what a, what a great training ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they were, I mean, I for the magazine we make up arrangements of songs and I've done quite a few Motown ones and the chord progressions. Just you know? amazing, yeah. You, yeah. You, you wonder about their, their training, where did they... Well, know? they were all jazz players mm. and they, they basically would get an arrangement from the producer and then put their stamp on it. And my main inspiration and love it, and my godfather is James Jamison because I, I used to feel so much from what the way he played because he basically was the opposite to what we get now. Everything today is structured, all the lines of riffs. With him, he would basically get the chord chart with the accents written out, but he would just go like like a, the Melbourne Cup on it with so many notes, but it never sounded busy, which is really strange because if you listen to some of the Motown, the bass playing is seriously busy. It's And it's... Sometimes, most of the time, he's not even playing the root note. It's it's all these different versions, and I think that's what drew me to him because he made it obvious that you didn't have to play anything the same twice. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, getting back to Renee, the first album was Ready to Deal, wasn't no, it? No, no, it was Renee Gaya for RCA Records. Okay. Which Gus McNeil produced it. And uh, it was some amazing tracks. I mean, we, we put it down in about two or three days. We had Mark Punch, Jim Kelly, um, all these at Bobby Gibbett. Russell Dunlop was the main man in Mother Earth. He was the drummer. He was he was basically call the shots, mainly because he had the heads up on, on soul music. And I think I learned most of my early stuff from Russell because Working with him, I really learned what it was like to work with a, a soul rhythm section, which I'd never done before that, really, whereas Copperwine were more bluesy. and But with Russell Dunlop, it was soul funk. And so that was my entrance. And uh, so we moved on from that, just with Renee learning from Russell, just who, who was a great teacher. Who wrote the songs for that album? They were actually picked by the record company. It was Gulliver Smith. It was Company Kane, he wrote a song, all sorts of great ballads, um, Buddy Miles songs, and... Um, like just, Ben Changes? Yeah, that's on the album. 
Ruth of Franklin, all these great, they, they figure, well, Rene can sing, so we'll pick all these great singers' songs. So, and it was an amazing, probably one of the things that I'm most proud of is that album in 1973, because in those days we used old Fender basses with strings that were like two, three times as heavy as what they use now, mm. with an action that was like three oh, quarters of an inch. Yeah. And what that meant is it was seriously fat and big, mm -mm -mm. which translated onto tape. So when you hear that first record, the, the, the bass sound is just massive, even though it was still early days for me. Luckily enough, I was, I was uh, hip to the fact that, you know, you have to work to get the sound and not let the amp or the bass do it. So it was just sheer energy play, playing those songs. Mm -hmm. I don't... How many albums did you work on with Renee? How, uh, do you know? Or oh, Basically, after... A, with uh, that first album, she moved to Melbourne and did the... the, the um, Recording down there? Yeah, she did a big orchestra album with with another one of my bass heroes, Barry Sullivan, who played a lot of the hits in those days, which he's on, on most of those Melbourne early 70s records because he was another guy that grooved and played the most amazing bass. He was the chain bass player. The cha Matt, Matt Taylor and Chain. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, he was, he was the number one right. down there. You know? And so we were great friends. So he took over from me with Renee for a couple of years. And then she moved to the States for a while, did some recording in the States with Jim Partridge, another one of my bass heroes, who is one of Australia's greats. And then she came back and formed the Ready to Deal band with, with uh, Barry Sullivan and uh, Mark Punch, Mal Logan, and some, some really great musos. Mm -mm -mm. But how many were you personally on? With uh, well, only three. Three? Yeah, yeah. So, apart from all the others, most of them are, uh, two or three were in America, and Barry Sullivan did a couple. So we, we swapped it around a fair bit. Mm. So, I was more of a the live man right. with Renee. So we, we just, she, she would do an album with some of the hot shots, but then I'd, I'd be out on the road playing it live. What was it like playing with her? Oh, exciting. Exciting because she, because we'd been together since she was 19, I knew her cues. So I was the only one that would have the balls to follow her cues. The rest of the band basically didn't want to take a chance on her wrath. <laughs> you know, I would know this is what she wants to do. And I would lead with the bass, the band in the changes because I, I basically took took it upon myself like I know what she wants and go. And so that's how, another reason why I think she used me a fair bit because she could, she, she was doing shows where there was never a set list. Mm. And basically she would go to a bridge section out of the blue. No one else knows she's going to the bridge. Right. I know she's going to the bridge. Right take the boys into the bridge. Right. I'd do something that would make it obvious, oh boys, we're going here, and I'd do it because of the experience of working with Renee and the fact that she works basically always loosely on the show being spontaneous. Yeah, yeah. So you never knew what you got with Renee. And that, I remember probably the most important thing in my whole career was when I would go out in the street after a big Renee show, and no one would know me because it was all the focus was on Renee, and people were like looking up, wow, what was that? That was unbelievable. Just hearing the people raving about what they just heard was, was inspirational. Like probably when they heard Aretha or someone, this is what they did. Renee was like that. She, she was seriously uh, took people to places they would never go with anyone else in Australia. Just a few words on my friend Di Pritchard, who is one of Australia's great guitar players. I started working with Di in uh, 2001 and Long Way to the Top and found out what an amazing guitar player in all genres. He covers so many areas that, you know, he's a very sought after guy and I just wanted to mention the fact that he's one of Australia's greats and if you get a chance to see Di at any gig, make sure you catch it because he's a monster.